Have you wondered about living elsewhere after you retire? Well, we have almost daily. As you know, it is not an overnight decision. Hi, this is Gil and Jean of Retire There, a podcast about places to consider living in during your retirement. Hey, guess what, folks? I retired. Oh, my goodness. This July 2021. I'm so sorry, Jean. I wish you could join me in the freedom, but you have a few more years for that pension. I don't think you're that sorry. I am. Can't you tell? We embarked on search for a new place to move for our retirement. We made a trip to Winter Park, Florida in February of 2020, came home and said, "Mm, maybe not for us. As we were planning for the next trip, the pandemic arrived. Jean then came up with this brilliant idea of doing a podcast to find out what others are doing. With so many baby boomers retiring, many must be relocating. So why not connect with them and pick their brains? Here's a little background about us. I'm Asian, born in Brazil and grew up in Flatbush, Brooklyn. I'm an engineer turned attorney turned podcaster. Oh man, I'm getting dizzy. (laughs) Yes, you are. (laughs) Thanks. I recently retired from my job practicing higher education law within a university. No more students, faculty, or staff. Whoa, this is going to be great. I love the college environment, but what do I honestly love even more? Hmm, sleeping in, not setting an alarm, staying up all hours, binging crime drama, and silly romantic comedies, developing the podcast, volunteering. Okay, let me stop. More to come, people. More to come. Jane? I'm not Asian. And as Gil mentioned, I'm not retired. I'm just plain tired. (laughs) I'm sorry. Born and raised in Long Island, New York, a place I've always wanted to leave. We've lived in Brooklyn, New York for many years and have been thinking about our future home. I'm a law librarian working in a court who loves his job, but we're retired by the time we select our ideal location. Mm, Don't know about that. (laughs) We've been speaking to folks from all around the country and world who have moved to their dream venues and more. So please stay tuned. And remember, if you know anyone who has moved anywhere for retirement, let us know. Bonjour. Today, retire their heads to Brittany, France. Brittany is in France, but are people from Brittany really French? It's been said that Bretons aren't French, but Celtic, linked by language and culture to the Irish, Scots, Cornish, and Welsh. Mm, I just conjured up a chicken. Okay. (laughs) On the other hand, Bretons have been in France since 1532. It can be disputed whether people from Brittany are more French or more Celtic, but it's clear that Brittany differs greatly from other parts of France. Brittany is about four and a half hours west of Paris, to give you some context. It is a hilly peninsula extending out towards the Atlantic Ocean. Its lengthy, rugged coastline is dotted with beach resorts built on rock in the English Channel. The pink granite coast is famed for its unusual blush-hued sand and rocks. Brittany is known for its abundant prehistoric menhirs, a type of megalith. But the thing that makes Brittany stand out most is the warmth and honesty of its people. So we hear. Here's a little bit about our guests. Jean? Mark Greenside grew up in Brooklyn and Long Island, New York. His mother was a teacher and father a lawyer. He has been a civil rights activist, Vietnam War protester, VISTA volunteer, union leader, author, and college professor. He attended the University of Wisconsin and left Madison with two degrees, a teaching credential, a wife, and unplanned honeymoon detention in a Chicago jail during the Democratic National Convention. He spent the first night at Lincoln Park with future Chicago 7 defendants Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman, who I spoke to once, by the way. (laughs) Uh (laughs) He spent the second night in jail. The third night, he was in George McGovern's suite at the Sheraton Blackstone watching it all on TV. He taught history and political science at a black university in Greensboro, North Carolina. Shortly thereafter, Mark moved to Berkeley, California. Nice. I'm jealous. He was still married, unemployed, living on food stamps, and was accepted to law school but decided not to go. His mother must have loved that decision. (laughs) <laughs> that's like your mother loving you after yeah. you graduate law school not practicing law <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> he started teaching history and political science at merrick college in oakland he did that until he was awarded a national endowment for the humanities grant 
to start an oral history project, which got him involved in working with older people. That led to his interest in stories and storytelling. Then he went to Vista College in Berkeley and set up what was at the time the largest and most comprehensive older adult education programs in the nation. After leaving that position, he held several jobs, got divorced, married again, this time to Donna, and eventually landed a coveted position as a full-time professor. In the mid-1990s, Mark started writing more seriously. He published a book of short stories titled, I Saw a Man Hit His Wife. In his 2008 book, I'll Never Be French, No Matter What I Do, Living in a Small Village in Brittany, he tells the story of how he was drawn to Brittany. In 1992, he was a New Yorker living in California, a doubting Thomas, downwardly mobile, political lefty, writer, and lifelong skeptic when he was dragged by his then-girlfriend, Catherine, to a tiny Celtic village in Brittany at the westernmost edge of France in Finisterre, the end of the world. He falls out of love with her and in love with Brittany. During that trip, at age 47, Mark ends up purchasing a house in Brittany. Wow. Pretty crazy. At the time of the purchase, he had only $5,000 to his name, and the most money he'd ever spent on anything was $1,500 for a used car. In 2018, Mark had two books published, a follow-up to I'll Never Be French called Not Quite Mastering the Art of French Living, and a novel titled A Night at the End of the Tunnel, or Isaiah Can You See? Thus far, Mark has enjoyed a rewarding and colorful life. These are just a few of the highlights. He was present at Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech in Washington, D.C. Through a Freedom of Information Act request, he learned the FBI has a 25-page file on him. Mine's much shorter. Wait, wait. How do you even know you have, a, how do you even know you have an FBI file? When I was in library school, uh, we had a project to, to get our files. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to get mine. <laughs> That'd be zero. <laughs> the, the FBI visited him when he was teaching at a predominantly black college in Greensboro, North Carolina. The school was visited by the KKK and National Guard. One student was killed, unfortunately. Now Gil will tell us about Donna. Donna Umeki was born and raised in Berkeley, California. She's also lived in Oakland and Alameda, California, where she and Mark presently live. She attended Berkeley Public Schools including UC Berkeley, and completed a bachelor's in accounting at Golden Gate University and received a master's in adult ed at San Francisco State. She was employed as a staff accountant in San Francisco and thereafter became self-employed as an accountant and in the past 10 years transitioned into overseeing her clients' accounting departments and annual audits. Donna is semi-retired in her business consulting, works about 15 to 20 hours a week, and given that she likes her work and her clients, well, that's unusual. Yeah. And they let her go anywhere and do anything as long as she stays available. She probably won't fully retire, at least for a while. Why should she? I mean, gosh, if I had clients who loved me and let me work anywhere, <laughs> but I, 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 you know, I wish I knew about such a thing. <laughs> Donna's pre-COVID interests include seeing live theater and the arts, visiting museums, traveling and flute playing. Cool. Because of the pandemic, she's become an avid fan of the San Francisco Giants baseball, cooking, trying to grow indoor plants. She admits she's killed a few. Writing and sending monthly haikus to say, to say hello to friends and family, taking walks in Alameda, and photographing houses and other sites that interest her, posting weekly on Facebook, as well as reading. Donna adds that she and Mark have known each other since 1981. Having met playing softball. Well, that's cool. They didn't start dating, however, till 93 and have been married for 24 years, which she notes is a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been fun. The couple is tri coastal. They split their time between Alameda, New York City, and Brittany. They live on an island in San Francisco Bay, so they walk the coastline a lot. During the pandemic, they have doubled their alcohol intake and doubled the price they're willing to pay for good wine. That's right. <laughs> good way to spend that retirement money, yeah, I tell exactly. you. Exactly. So welcome to Retire There, Mark and Donna. We know you guys spend time in France and the U.S. What's the split and when do you go abroad? And how did you decide 
to buy in Brittany? Why don't we start there? Buy, <laughs> buying in Brittany. So the, my, my first book, I'll Never Be French, um, No Matter What I Do, tell, <laughs> tells the story of, um, of the buying of the house. As, as, as Jean said, at the time, you know, I really owned nothing but the clothes on my back and, and at that point, 20-year-old car. Basically, I, I, I grew up believing property was theft and had uh, no idea that uh, I would ever own anything. I actually had no interest in owning anything. Sort of viewed myself as a renter for life. I wound up going to, to Brittany unwillingly with my girlfriend. I really didn't want to go. I, I, I wanted to go to Saskatchewan where you could... Uh, drive and speak English, um, not have to deal with an airplane or French, or at the time, French people. Uh, my previous experience in France was in the 1960s. At that point, and I was only in Paris also, and at that point, there was a good deal of hostility towards Americans because of uh, Vietnam, because of de Gaulle, because of the nationalism in, in France, and because of Paris being Paris. So that was my only experience in being in France, and I had really no desire to go back. But I did have a desire to maintain that relationship, and the only way to do it was to go. So I went, immediately had a reaction, a physical reaction of wonder and 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 joy to the to the beauty of the place just the the physical uh, beauty of Brittany um you know most of the impressionist painters went there to paint because of the light um it's this shimmering northern ocean light even on rainy days it's it's this silvery shimmering gorgeous gorgeous light wow. and all of the impressionist painters went there gorgon had his school about an hour from where we live monet went went there it was very very popular among among the um, visual artists, as you read, the the landscape is gorgeous. The hills are covered with heather in the summer. Oh. It's rocky promontories. Beautiful. The beaches are pristine. They're every bit as beautiful as the beaches in in, in Provence and Antibes. The only reason it's not as much of a tourist place is because it rains. Mm. Um, you can get two or three weeks worth of rain, and if you're on a two or three week vacation. You don't really want to spend it there. But for people like us who are going for two and three months, it's perfect. The beaches, the beaches are, are, are beautiful. The, the skies, the clouds, Donna will talk about the clouds. She's a cloud expert photographer. <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous skies. The, wet, uh, the, um, the water in the Atlantic, because it's on the opposite side of New York and New England, is the Gulf Stream. So the Atlantic over there is actually quite warm. And in the north, you have the English Channel. So Brittany is bordered on the north by the English Channel, on the west by the Atlantic. So it's just it's just a gorgeous place. So it was easy sort of like being there. And then we met people. You know, I don't speak French. I didn't speak French then. I don't speak French now. I, I know a lot of words, but nobody would say what I say has anything to do with French. <laughs> <laughs> he uses all present tense. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a be I'm a be here now kind of guy. <laughs> I love your shirt that says "Pardon my French." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. And Donna, do you speak French? Well, quite a bit. I I took French in college mm -hmm. okay. for about three years. I'm pretty adept at languages, so I just took Latin, Spanish, Russian, Japanese. Oh wow! French. Wow. But one of the things that happens is because for most of the time, I'm there, I've been there longer. On each visit, I'm there longer than Donna. And I spend at least a month or, or five weeks alone. And I've been going longer than Donna. So people are so used to my bastardized French that when she comes and speaks real French, they look at me and say, like, what, what, did, what she did she say? say? <laughs> That's amazing. That's now, funny. Donna, you were born and raised in Berkeley, but you're of Japanese heritage. Is that correct? Yes. So yes. did you learn Japanese at all from family or through school? I had to take Japanese in college. Wow. You took two languages for X years in college? Yeah. Well, oh, that's amazing. Wow. The first language I learned was Latin. No, actually Spanish in elementary school. Latin in junior high school, Russian in um, high school. Wow. Wow. You'd be a great interpreter. Do you have? Well, you, I can't interpret anything now. <laughs> <laughs> Except I try to translate and interpret Mark, but that's about it. Okay. That's, a, that's a full time job. 
Wow. Since, well, I give you credit for all those languages. That is amazing. Since we're on this subject, do a lot of people in Brittany speak English? More so now. Not I, I bought the house in 1992. Mm-hmm. At that point, not very many. And, and even those who did were not comfortable doing so. You they, did, to, they didn't want to make like a fool, what they thought it, it would be like they're making a fool of themselves. The French language to French people is very, very precise. And they notice each, you know, each other's mistakes, especially gender mistakes. I and mean, we have a friend who's been in, in uh, she married a Breton guy. She's uh, Canadian. She's been there 40 years. She's fluent in French, but she makes gender mistakes and people correct her all the time. Wow. They correct yeah. her? <laughs> uh, yeah, they correct her. Yeah. And I've seen people, you know, like I, somebody sent me a note and of course I can't read it. So I give it to one of my friends and they read it and they comment on the handwriting. They comment on the grammar. Oh, wow. What? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, but yeah. they can't all have perfect handwriting. No, no. They, they don't. But it's the culture but a standard they recognize as being the high end and they want to be on the high end. One of the interesting things is for me is, is that I'm on the low end. I've lowered the bar so low <laughs> that they lower their bar to talk to me. And they speak <laughs> very slowly. To yeah, us. That's, that's so nice. So, well, I so, don't know if that's nice. Well, no, no, that that is nice. That is but, nice. but in terms of the criticizing people, you know, this just goes to to the theory that the French are cold. Yeah, I mean, they, when we were in Paris, we encountered some of that. I didn't dare. They were mostly OK, though. All right. Paris is a different universe. The people in Brittany don't like the Parisians. The Parisians are, are disliked almost as much as the Germans when they come. Wow. <laughs> not, not only that, when they look at license plates right. and they can identify the Parisian license plate and they always make a comment and they kind of go. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, yeah. So funny. Yeah. Par- Parisians don't have a great reputation in the rest of France. Oh, but I bet they love Brittany. So they're probably there right often. Um, they, you know, many uh, France has, is the country with the most uh, number of second homes. So wow. lots and lots of people have second homes in Brittany. They come from Brittany and they go back on the holidays. By the way, I saw one of your videos. Your home is beautiful. Yeah, it is gorgeous. It's really, it really gorgeous. is. I mean, it's one of the reasons I bought it. I mean, when I was looking at houses, when my friend, my French friend, Madame P in the books um, took me to the notaire to look at houses. And I looked at prices. I mean, I had no money. You know, I could buy a house, a three story stone stone farmhouse with a three quarters of an acre of land and a gorgeous, gorgeous place for less than the price of a Mercedes. But can you tell us what you paid for that house in 1992? Uh, I paid about between 75 and 80,000. Wow. US dollars. Yeah, dollar, US dollars. Yeah. And how much would a house have cost yeah. back then in the the Bay Area? Three hundred to four hundred. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, no, it was it was incredible. I mean, one of the things about France in general is is housing, except again in the major cities, you know, like Paris, but generally housing is cheap and affordable. So what would today's prices be average? Or give us an idea. To buy or rent? To, to buy. buy. Well, again, it depends on where you are. We're we're in in a in a rural area. It's a village of five hundred. There's no work, you know, so you can't be going there to get a job. It's in a uh, designated parkland, so it's it's protected, sort of like what we would call a redevelopment uh, area in some ways. So the taxes are low. So in in that area, you can still get things for a hundred thousand wow. dollars in Brittany. Yeah, wow. I mean, you might have to do some work on it. But yeah, you can still get things for a hundred. Once you go to two and two fifty, you can get some really beautiful things. Wow. wow. So, so what would that look like? What a two bedroom, maybe? Um, yeah, yeah, it would be two bedroom. And today's well, actually, real estate in rural areas because of COVID is going up. Yeah, because everybody yes. wants to leave the cities. Yeah. All so, over. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what my place would be worth. Maybe two fifty to three. That's it, huh? Wow. In today's market, I'm, I'm guessing. And but how I, big is your place? It's got a, a full, fully finished attic, which is essentially a double bedroom with a private bath, the three skylights that face face the river. Ooh. And then the, the second floor is uh, two bedrooms, a bath. First floor is a kitchen, a TV, sort of sitting library room, and then a huge living room, dining room. Wow. Which used to be a cafe. Yeah. Oh, how cute. Wow. The village is, it used to be a working port. 
Oh, wow. um, and uh, through the 50s, it was a working port. So every house on the quay, and we're, we're on the quay, also had a cafe built in for to make some extra money. What's a quay? What we would call a, a, what, a, a quay, Q-U-A-Y. Q-U-A-I. Oh. Okay. You know, the, the area that runs along the side of a river? Oh, oh yes, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay. okay. gotcha. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. In the, in the book, you talk about how buying a house in France is a lot different than buying a house in the U.S., and you talk about how the people who sold you the house, they threw in a car. Yeah. And they, and they were friends with you for a while, right? Yes. Yes. That's wonderful. Uh, I, yeah. I saw them, uh, you know, every time we were there, I was, saw them, uh, you know, almost weekly for like 18 years. Wow. Yeah. The whole buying of a house thing was was a, a fascinating experience. And I don't know if it's still as easy today, but it, it was extraordinarily easy. And again, I had the help of my friend, Madam P, who was sort of like an Aladdin who could just open any door possible it seemed <laughs> and and although although you didn't get a loan there you said that getting a loan for a house in france is is easier than getting a bank account or getting your phone turned on yeah you can't get your <laughs> phone turned on or a bank account without a note from somebody or some proof of something but again i don't know how much is because of madam p they were willing to make me a loan on the spot for our listeners who haven't read your book can you give us uh-huh. a little background to Madam P. Who is this Madam P? Okay, sure. When I went with my girlfriend in 1991, we rented a house and Madam P was the keeper of the keys to that rented house. We saw her all the time and her and her family. Um, they were right, They lived right next door. We had multiple problems with the house. She solved all of them. It, she took it upon herself to become, and her family, to become uh, sort of a, a tourist information office. They took us everywhere. They made sure we experienced different areas, different foods, different environments. And they really took care of us. And uh, we, we became quite close. Uh, her eldest son uh, was fluent in English, so that helped a lot. He didn't live there full time. But when he did come, it made things easier. And we, we just connected. It was, a, it was an immediate um, or almost immediate connection. And it continues till today. Oh, wow. She, she's actually the same age as you, right? Yeah, but I, I didn't know that until about five years ago. I always thought she was at least 10 years older, maybe more. Just because, not because of, of, of appearance, because Her knowledge. she knew everything and I knew nothing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> she could mm-hmm. solve everything. Uh, so I became, I become like an infant there. <laughs> <laughs> so she led you to the house that you're in now, even though she would lose the rental, right? Fees. It wasn't and... her rental. She just had the keys. It wasn't oh, her oh, she was like, was, a super somebody else place. rented it and then left the keys with her to give to us. I see. Okay. And then okay. she was sort of an overseer of the house while the owner was gone. So okay. she was being paid. I don't know. We don't talk about money a lot in France. <laughs> That's good. Oh, okay. All it right. is good. It's good. And so long as until you have to buy something and then they say <laughs> so many, you know, <laughs> what is the currency exchange now? Do we know? Yeah, it's about the euro is about uh, one, one, a dollar 15 or 16. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's fluctuated. When I, when I bought the house, there was francs and mm-hmm. it was six francs to the dollar, which was a really, really good exchange. Mm. Okay. Um, actually, that's not when I bought the house. That's when I made the offer. When I, I bought did. the house, it was five five point three francs to the dollar. Again, selling and buying is uh, is much different in France. The buyer and the seller come to an agreement, and that agreement is then written up as the contract, and it's made official by a state official called a notaire. Okay who is a lawyer, but also has other sort of managerial responsibilities. So the notaire makes this private agreement that you make with the, that the buyer and the seller make, makes it official. I went in with all kinds of plans to lower the price because that's the way my family buys everything. You (laughs) you negotiate everything. (laughs) The deal we made was I accepted everything they had with the, uh, at the price they wanted with the only stipulation being if the franc dropped below 5.7, I could renege. I could get out. At the time I made the offer, it was six. Six francs to the dollar, which was pretty good. It was, that means there were, the, 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 the franc was worth less than 20 cents each, which was, which was pretty good. Um, by the time I, I bought it, it had dropped to five three or five four, 
which was about an $8,000 difference. Um, and briefly, briefly, I thought maybe I shouldn't do this. Um, but it, that, that really didn't last long. Um, but that was the only stipulation in the contract. If the exchange rate dropped below five, seven, okay. uh, I could okay. call it off. Oh, great. Great. So it, it went pretty smoothly. It sounds like it went, it went very smoothly. Of course, yeah. I didn't know what was going on. That probably helped. If yeah. I understood, I would have a zillion questions. Yeah. But yeah. And what's with the car? You got a car out of this? Yeah, I did. We were at the uh, notaire's office for the for the closing, and here's a, here's a sign. Yeah, the, the notaire reads a paragraph, and uh, the the couple I'm buying the house from the the woman is an English teacher, so she's totally fluent in English. Nice. She translates the paragraph into a sentence, and <laughs> and both of us initially writing read and understood. <laughs> you know, so I I, okay. I didn't understand anything. Uh, mm-hmm. But and all the time, your mother is just looking. Yeah, at my you. mother was there because I borrowed the money from her to, to sure. pay for the house. Right, and uh, she's not questioning anything. She's just looking at her oldest son, very happy for him. Oh, wow. well, and you know, my dad, my dad was was a lawyer. You know, say, he, oh, good. You don't, you didn't even sign birthday cards without having them vetted by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I love it. Here, here, here I am signing signing something I can't read or understand. He um, brought you but, up well, right? <laughs> exactly. So you know, I had no idea what I what what I was doing. I, I'm totally totally relied upon the people who were selling the house, and they were totally totally honest. And what they they did two amazing things at the closing after all the papers were signed. Uh, they said, now we're going to tell you about the house. And they said, we knew this was your house as soon as we met you. Because do you know where the house is? And I said, yeah, you know, it's at the far end of the village in an area called Gilly Gloss. And they said, do you know what Gilly Gloss means in Breton? I said, no. Mm-hmm. And they said, it means Greenside, Monsieur Greenside. <gasps> no. No way. Yeah. Oh, that is yeah, so because it's facing the green side of a hill. Oh, so wow. they said we knew it was meant to be. <laughs> and then they said, <laughs> because I had asked them to leave me what they could, you know, when they cleaned out the house, because I had nothing. Yeah. You know, and I didn't know this at the time, but in France, they don't leave the refrigerator. They don't they, basically they take everything. They left me all kinds of things. They left me a kitchen table, they left me a bed, they left me an armoire. Wow. And and it wasn't junk. It was really good nice. quality stuff. They left me a set of dishes. They weren't all chipped and cracked. <laughs> and they gave me the keys to their car. That's unusual, they, right? They were going to buy a new one. Okay. Wow. But that's got to be unusual. That doesn't come with all French deals, <laughs> I assume. No. Right. <laughs> right. And who pays the fee to the, what do you call him? No, who pays the fee? I do. The but, buyer oh, pays. Here's the other thing. I had the money wired to my bank account in France. I opened up a bank after the agreement was written up and we signed it. The, the notaire gave me a note to bring to the bank so I could open up a bank account because I had to wire money for the down payment, which was somewhere around 10,000. I forgot what it was. And then I had to wire money for the for the buying. And there's, that's a whole nother story about how do I get the money there? How do I wire it? Who do I trust? I wind up dealing with a guy named Gary in Utah who I never met, never saw, <laughs> knew nothing about. And I'm wiring him $75,000. Oh, you know, again, I'm watching my dad, you know, just uh, <laughs> he's getting a stroke. <laughs> he's already gone, but he's getting another one. Yeah. <laughs> another stroke. So, sorry. Yeah. So I wire this money and I get to France for the closing. I, I go with my mom. The money's not there. <laughs> it, it doesn't show up. Oh my God. And so I start calling this guy, Gary, in Utah from France. Oh. He's never at his desk. Somebody's always saying, oh, yeah, he's here, but he's not here. So this goes on for, you know, like 10 days. I still don't have the money. They haven't tracked it. And I run into the notaire and he says, we're going to do the closing tomorrow. And I get to use one of the few sentences I had been practicing. Je n'ai pas d'argent. I don't have any money. <laughs> oh, my God. And he says, that's OK. We'll do it tomorrow. Oy. So we did the closing and I had no money in the bank. Everything was official. Everything was signed off on. Wow. They gave me the keys to the car. They Whoa. gave me the keys to the house. 
they walked away. They had no money. And I was the one feeling like, Jesus, did I just get ripped off? <laughs> oh, my Lord. And, and I'm sorry. Where did Gary from Utah pop up from? I mean, I found a foreign exchange office okay. that would that would give me a fairly good exchange rate on the seventy five thousand dollars and then wire it to this bank. This is all done. You know, this is this is pre Internet. Right. Okay? So this is all done by telephone. <laughs> And when did the money show up? It showed up. The, uh, the, the money eventually showed up. It had been wired to Corsica. Oh, my God. And they, somehow about a week or two after the closing, uh, the money showed up in the account. And the only reason I know is because I would go to the bank every day and see this nice young girl, this one about 16 or 17, oh. who was the teller. And every day I'd, I'd walk in and she'd just shake her head. Oh, my you know? God. It's like a so I walked in one day and she's beaming. She says, it's here. Oh. <laughs> And then I had to write a check to pay for all this, but I didn't know how to write a check. Oh. I mean, at the time, it was it was something like four hundred thousand or more euro, uh, francs. I didn't know how to write the number. And <laughs> in France, the date is reversed. You know, we yes, we, yes, yes, yes. Day, so, month, so I didn't know how to write the date. I didn't know how to write the number. <laughs> and the top line is not the amount. The top line is who it's going to. The okay. bottom, the second line is the amount. So. The 16-year-old behind the counter had to rake out the check for me. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. This is some story. This also proves, this also no, proves to, that it, we can do this, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to understand, in this country, I am a control freak. Definitely. I, I, I want to know from today to a year out what's happening and how I can, oh. and how I can control it. Right. In France, I can't go five minutes. Right. That, oh I've heard that. All right. Let's move on to how okay. much time do you spend in each place? Yeah. Brittany, New York City, and California. It's yeah. very, so you're well, tri-coastal. Before the pandemic, it was about three months, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's um, pre- again, it, I retired in 2011. Before then, we were on a, a teacher schedule. So we would go in the summers, you know, June, July, August. And, uh, and Donna was working quite a bit. really full time. So usually I would go for a month to five weeks mm-hmm. before her okay. to uh, get the house ready. Yeah. That's what he claimed. That's what he claimed. <laughs> five weeks of cleaning. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did it, did it show Donna? <laughs> uh, I think the weekend before I would show up, that's when he started cleaning <laughs> madly. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I mean, the times would vary, but after I, I retired and Donna reduced, I would say we would spend two to three months in France, and that would include some traveling around France, mm-hmm. and then one to two months in New York, uh, another month traveling in the States, usually in, in, in the West, you know, California, the rest of the yeah. time here in the Bay Area. Okay. Okay. Now, when you're in New York, where where are you? Like in by your family and all that? Um, yeah, we stay we stay with family, and and we inherited some property in in New York also. Okay, um, we stay with with family for a while, or for a long time. We stayed with my mom mm-hmm. uh, on the Upper West Side, mm-hmm. and then um, and now we're sharing a place with my brother also on the Upper West Side. Okay, all right. So you get to enjoy Manhattan when you're in the city, yeah. which is good, mm-hmm. which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And San Francisco, man, you've got it all. He's in well, San thing. Francisco. He's in Manhattan, Unbelievable. and yeah. he's in Brittany. Man, I you know it's this like the guy who claims he had nothing in nineteen ninety two. It's amazing. Plus, plus for him, it's still never enough. For me, as a Buddhist, we've got more than enough. Oh, you yeah. have more than, more than right? Enough. Exactly. Oh my God, I I I'm grateful for you. <laughs> <laughs> Come visit us. <laughs> So, wow. so Donna, had you been to France before? No, no. Oh, yes. I started. It's uh, funny because we actually started dating the year after he bought the house. Oh. Nice. So you that missed all that. So, yes. Yeah, perfect timing for me. Perfect. <laughs> when Donna first came over oh, and, and there were no there are no Asians in the area, except for maybe you. At that point, maybe one Vietnamese person with a restaurant. Oh. And people, you know, again, this is a very, this is a very rural, very, very white, very homogenous mm-hmm. uh, area. 
Mm-hmm. And people would literally walk up to Donna and touch her hair <gasps> and say, oh my goodness. what are you? Oh my but they did, it, they did it in a very um, more fascinating or curious way. Yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't offended at all. I was just okay. surprised that someone uh-huh. would, you know, just come up and touch your hair. Oh, my God. But, you know, <laughs> I was at that time I was exotic. Yeah, I'm not exotic anymore. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, so has, has it become diverse over the years since you've been there or? Not in terms of, of residents, but in terms of visitors there, okay. it, it's, it's more diverse. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and what about like eateries? Let, let's, let's talk about the food for a moment. Um, you said there was a Vietnamese restaurant. What, what yeah. about other foods now in the area? What's, what's available? Well, again, it depends on whether or not you go. If you're talking the village, it's it's French, and the, and the, basically the the food is um, crepe and seafood. Oh, yeah, uh, that's good. And, and, <laughs> I could live with that. And both are, are delicious. Okay, yeah. You said it depends you where. Go, What's the other place? Out to, like the the city of Brest is about a quarter of a million people. You find anything there? You find you find sushi. You find Italian food. You find African food. And how far know, is that? Uh, Forty minutes. Oh, oh, so you have to drive. Okay. You have to drive. Okay. Yeah. If you want to get any anything a, exotic in the village, the, uh, there is Asian food, but, you know, like everywhere you go, it's seasoned to suit the taste of the people who live there. Mm-hmm. French mm-hmm. people on the whole don't like piquant. Spice. They don't like spices, mm. hot spices. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So you don't get hot Thai, Szechuan, mm-hmm. um, which we like. Mm-hmm. So the, the the Asian food is sort of bland. Probably the most exotic food you get is Italian food. Mm. Pizza. Uh, pizza. Pizza. <laughs> oh, that's delicious. really exotic. <laughs> and, I guess and, it is. Lasagna. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, you know what? It's good that half the year you're in San Francisco and Manhattan. <laughs> you can, you know, get high in all the Asian food or all the other well, kinds. Yeah. Like about, about the balance. Yeah. You know, yeah, I yeah. mean, it's an urban rural balance. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we could never live full time in the village. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. too small. Just last night in Alameda, we went to a really good Italian restaurant. And the day before, we went to a really good Vietnamese restaurant. And it's, you know, we just assume that we're going to find anything here. Yeah. yeah you guys yeah. have everything yeah. out, out in uh, the Bay Area. Yeah. Can we talk about the cost of living in no, Brittany? Before that, before that, um, you talk about one of the main reasons you, you wouldn't live in Brittany year round is also the weather, that it's really cold in the winter. Is that how cold does it get? It rarely freezes. It rarely snows. It's, it's damp. It rains. It's damp. It's that. It's sort of that bone chilling cold. But it's not. It's not so much that it's temperature. It's just that it goes through you. Uh, it's dark. We have a, a dehumidifier going twenty four hours a day in the house. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. it's I'm, very damp. Yeah, it rains a lot, and also um, there's a river right across the road in front of us. So um, it 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 is damp. But the weather is a lot like the Bay Area. The temperature <laughs> range, the temperature range okay. is a lot like the Bay Area. It okay. rains a lot more there. Yeah. So, um, so, so the summers aren't that hot. No, no, no. It, I mean, again, everything's changing now, right? With right. The yeah, climate. climate. But yeah. normal, normally, you'd have maybe four or five days in the nineties. Um, otherwise, it's mostly in the seventies and eighties. Wow. Okay. Nice. So, so let yeah, me let me make sure. Let me make sure I understand year round, although I know you're not there year round, but right. year round is, is it kind of like, um, what would you equate that to? Like two seasons, it rains a lot. Right. And, yeah. think, and think it can Seattle. get, yeah, but he said it gets bone chilling cold. So no. you've got to have like no, warm, but, but he corrected me. It doesn't That's oh. because of the dampness. Yeah. Not, yeah. Because, not because uh, of the temperature. So, but when you go outside, you need like heavy clothing, right. Or layers or whatever. Yeah, I was only there once in the winter, and yeah, I wore winter clothes. I wore New York winter clothes. Okay. Oh, wow. But it but it doesn't snow and it doesn't freeze. But except for the also rain. Also, in the as you go into September and October, the days are much much shorter right. because it's farther north. Mm-hmm. So you're waking up in the dark, and then you have like maybe from 
eight to four, you have this window of opportunity and then it gets dark. But in the summer, it's light until almost midnight. Okay. I have to tell you, except for the rain, the weather sounds wonderful to me. It's it's cool enough. It's not too hot. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't mm-hmm. snow in the winter. Right. It is. Yeah. It is. I mean, even people who are there don't want to be there in the, in the winter. It's rough. Okay. The days it's, are short. It's cold. It's dark. It doesn't sound uh, so rough. Right. I think you've been living in California way too long, Mark. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Can you tell them about the guy in Hawaii? Oh, yeah. So, you know, I rent the house also when we're not there. And there was a guy from Hawaii who wanted to, to, to rent it. And he wanted to, to go December, January, February, March. And I'm thinking, this guy's from Hawaii and he wants to go there like November, December, January, March. He's going there to commit suicide. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm not going to rent to him. You know, oh my so I, I, I finally convinced him. You know, he said to me, look, I, I've had enough sun in my life. So I finally convinced him to rent from January into April, May. So he'd be moving into the sun. Oh. And it worked out fine. And he agreed. Fine. Yeah. Wow. He's still living. Still living. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let me get this straight. The cold months. That's about yeah. what? Four, four months. It starts in, said, in November, usually. Right, November, November, December, January, February are the worst. It can be okay, cold in okay. March. And it, can be, it can also be cold in April, May. I've turned okay. the heat on in June. Okay. No, I just want to give a sense to, you know, everyone listening. All right. I, I, I'd like to move on to the cost of living in sure. Brittany. Give us a sense of that. Let's see. The gas. Yes. Yeah, uh, gasoline is, you know, very, very expensive. Mm-hmm. Um like what? Anywhere from six to eight dollars a gallon. Wow. wow. It's double um, hours. Yeah. And that's double. why they all drive very small cars. Yes. <laughs> Have they started? I, I refer to them as cartoon cars. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I love that. it. Yeah. Yeah. Those little Fiat. Have they started buying electric cars there? Yes, yeah. but th- there are no stations, you know, no <laughs> no charging stations. What good is that? Wait, yeah. So go back to uh, yeah, cost of living. Uh wine is cheap. Good wine is cheap. <laughs> Actually, food is about the same as here, except the quality is 10 times better. Oh, wow. uh, the, 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 For the same money, you get very, very high end, you know, um, uh, organic type uh, kind of food, m- uh, marketplace food, very, very fresh food. Okay. Seafood, uh, there's a poissonnerie in the, vill- in the next village, mm-hmm. um, fresh catch every day. Nice. Wow. Uh, and seafood can, can be expensive. But again, the quality is is excellent. Top rate. Housing is is affordable. When I when I rent the house, I get between twenty five hundred and three thousand a month. When I rent it to American tourists mm-hmm, mm-hmm. over there, it will rent for five or six hundred euros a month. Wow. So rent is, is much, much cheaper. But over there the renter pays all the utilities. Oh. Okay. Everything. Okay. Every, and, and and maybe even the taxes. I'm not sure about that. You can live, and they they have a cost. Uh, they have a, a minimum wage that uh, at this point is it, it had been greater than ours, but ours has been going up. So they're about equal. And France is now just giving stipends to any any household that's making less than twenty two hundred a month. Oh wow! Because of COVID? And no, because of uh, income. Because of prices are going up. Oh wow! Uh, oh, wow. That's great. I mean, they have a lot of protections. For instance, you uh, you can't evict somebody in the winter. You can't turn off their electricity in the winter. Their heat. Uh, renters have a lot of rights. Nice. And okay. squatters have a lot of rights. There are horror stories about trying to get rid of squatters. Oh my wow, goodness! Oh, I can imagine out of houses. The medical system is terrific. Yeah, I was you know, ask you, mm-hmm. anything you need is is available and it is affordable. Mm-hmm. It's accessible. Mm-hmm. We've used the pharmacy system, we've used the doctor system, and we have friends who have used the hospital system. And so we're really pretty familiar with all of it, including dentists. Do you have to be a resident or? or no. Be, okay. No. We had friends visiting from, from California. The guy woke up one morning with a severe pain that they thought was appendicitis. Mm-hmm. This is a Sunday morning. Wow. Sunday morning, we called the doctor every weekend. The paper lists which pharmacy, which doctor, and which boulangerie for bread are open on the weekend. Oh wow! <laughs> I love the priority. <laughs> so we we called 
Madam P, who called the doctor. And within 20 minutes, the doctor's making a house call on a Sunday morning. Wow. He goes upstairs, examines our friend, concludes it's probably appendicitis, makes a phone call. The ambulance comes. They take him to the hospital. They ask him two things. What's your name? What's your age? He's in. Wow. That's wonderful. That's it. That's it. And it ended up being very, a very serious. It was, he yeah. had uh, a blockage of his colon and, and wow. uh, bless you. And they actually did surgery and he was in the hospital for like 12 days. His wife moved in with him. What? So she was in the, in wow. the hospital with him and, um, you know, he came home and, and, and the, the bill was, you know, less than a week in Hawaii and his insurance paid it off. <laughs> his, his American insurance paid it off? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, his wow. American health insurance paid it off. Wow. Yeah. Did they charge the wife for the stay? No. no. And in fact, <laughs> the head wow. nurse took her home. Th- this is a woman that had a, a double lung kidney. kidney transplant at Stanford. So mm. she had very, very specific medical needs and dietary needs. And the head nurse took her home every night. What? Oh, my goodness. And, and she slept there every night, prepared foods for her. Drove her to the hospital every day, even when she wasn't working. Wow. Oh my God. And they became lifelong friends. I'll bet. Oh the my nurse God. incredible. visited uh, her in California. Wow. This is not yeah, like no, the, the medical f- system is, is, is a wonder. It's, it's usually listed with, with Japan as one of them is the top two. Okay. Wow. The Japanese oh, this- and the French. This hospital was in Brittany? Yeah, it was in it was 20 minutes away. Yeah. Wow. So, all right. So, you wow. guys are, when you say accessible, it's right there, even though it's kind of rural, but you're close to all this. Well, we're close to the, to the town of Camp Pear, which has about 75,000 people, and that has a couple of hospitals. Oh, wow. wow. There's a little clinic in the village next to ours, which has 7,000 people. Mm-hmm. Um, they couldn't do anything serious. Brest, which is about 40, 45 minutes away, has several major hospitals. Okay. Okay. But these hospitals do do transplants. I mean, they've done heart transplants. We know oh. somebody who's gotten a heart transplant. And they're high end hospitals. Wow. This wow. is amazing. And they speak English? Most of the doctors do. Let me ask you, it, is your area walkable? Would you say elder friendly? Well, our area is. Yes and no. It's very walkable because it's flat. flat. Uh, we're in a valley and there's a you could walk into the next village two miles away it's completely flat there's a path uh, next to the river there's a road but it's not what we would call older adult accessible there are no sidewalks the the streets are good if you go to the really old areas you know you've got cobblestones it's it's uneven you don't always have benches The, the french are not always good at making things convenient I mean, you'll find older people waiting in line with everybody else. Nobody's saying move forward. (laughs) But there are mobility issues. It's Mm -hmm. not easy to just walk around in places like Paris. Yeah, uh, interesting. We interviewed yeah some people from I think it was um, Ecuador, where there is a separate line for elderly people in the supermarkets, and if there's ever a wait, they take precedence. Um, No. So that's interesting. No. Okay. There's a lot of elderly people where we live. Yeah. I mean, they just built a new, very high-end residence for Mm -hmm. um, uh, older adults, sort of like assisted living. But but it costs. Yeah. Um, By our standards, it's cheap, but not by their standards. They're going through maybe what we went through maybe 20 years ago. What do you do with older parents? You know, I mean, they, they, they were more a, a, of a family unit. And then, you know, older parents moved in with, with kids. But, sure. uh, you know, the houses are smaller. The families are more nuclear. The people have moved away. But, um, but they have that um, housing law, the mother. Yeah, well, that's if somebody dies. So their inheritance laws are different also. It used to be, uh, you know, uh, primogenitor where, where uh, the eldest son got everything. But what was happening was the eldest son was throwing out mom. Oh, God. So oh you had goodness. a whole bunch of, this is years ago, mm-hmm. you had a whole bunch of, of homeless moms. Oh, so my they God. changed the rules. That is so, so that sad. The, the, <laughs> yeah. You know, I always remind my son, um, well, my mother used to say when it was my birthday, she would say, it's not your birthday. 
It's my birthday, the day that I gave birth to you. That's right. Oh, and I, that's and, right. and I go, I go, oh, so when is my birthday? <laughs> <laughs> I was so confused. So I repeat that story to our son and he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's my yeah. gun? <laughs> that's a good story. That's a good story. Yeah. Wait, so, so go on. What happens to these so, homeless so now, moms? This now is horrible. The, now the law is the siblings, no matter how many there are, get 50%. And the um, surviving spouse gets 50%. Ah, okay. The ownership of the house. So even if a will says something, you can't have a will that says something different. You might be able to, but everybody would have to agree to the will. Ah, you, oh you, can't, you can't disinherit like that in mm-hmm. France. And if the surviving spouse dies, then that goes to all the kids? Yes. Oh, and okay. and that presents a problem in, in, in France because you can't sell the property without everybody agreeing. So, for instance, remember I told you the notaire is the one who makes the private agreement mm-hmm. official? Yes. One of the things the notaire does is he posts the deal. I don't know if he posts the whole thing, but mm-hmm. he posts it in case anybody has a claim against it, any distant relative. Mm. And he has to post it for a period of time, several months. Sure, sure. To make sure nobody's going to come forward and say, hey, that's mine and I don't want to sell it. Right. So, for instance, two places down, two lots down from our place, there was a house that was vacant for over 20 years because the siblings couldn't agree to sell it. Oh, man. (laughs) Weeds everywhere. I mean, it just... (laughs) With an eyesore, because right, so so they don't even care about about trying to sell it. And- well, some of them wanted to keep it, some of them wanted to sell it, some of them didn't agree on the price, and I mean they mm-hmm. finally sold it a couple of three years ago. Oh, they did. Yeah, finally. But it took them that long to figure it out. Yeah, you know these family matters. I can I can relate. Uh, that's, well, that's why it's good being born poor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Or or just having one child. <laughs> Like us. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, where is the nearest airport? Like when you go back to the States from Brittany? Brest. Well, th- yeah, there's, there's two airports, but they're not internet. Well, they, it's international, but not to the States. To go to the States, it's Paris. So we fly from Paris. You can go from Brest to Paris by plane. You can go from that other town I mentioned, Tampere. Mm-hmm. Uh, by plane uh, to Paris. It's about a, a 50 minute flight. Okay. Uh, you can also go from both places by train. Okay. And you can and you can drive. Okay. Brest is an international airport only to England and Ireland, maybe to Spain. What's your trip like when you decide you want to go back to San Francisco? You know, what are the steps? First, we would decide if we're if we're driving, flying or or training. Train. Lately, we've been flying. We would go to Brest. Mm-hmm. And how far is that? 45 minutes. The thing is, the connecting flight that we that we take usually leaves at six in the morning. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So that means we get up at three in the middle of the night, get everything together, get load up the car and, and you know, shut down the house, get into the car, a shower, get into the car around four, drive to the airport, get there at five, have to turn in the car because it's a rental and then go check in. So we're starting at three in the morning. Oh, yeah. We get to Paris, maybe seven, seven thirty in the morning. Usually the flight out is somewhere between 10 and 11 in the morning. And then it's a, an 11 hour flight to San Francisco. All right. So you're like on uh, like major jet lag for, well, you're, you're commuting yeah, no, for 24 it's, it's hours. Still, <laughs> it's 24 hours. But before I bought the house in France, I, I was looking at a house in, in Wyoming. I had been to a writer's colony in Wyoming, and I, I, for the same reasons, that, it was gorgeous. The light, the land, the sky, the open space. I like broad horizons. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Wyoming is it's next to Montana, big skies, big sky mm-hmm, area. Mm-hmm. And Brittany is like that. The horizon is very low. Mm-hmm. So it's huge, huge it sky. Nice. You have the sense of endless space. But you talk and, about white places. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. And the village I was in in Wyoming had 25 people, 20 times uh, village in France is 20 times larger. Anyhow, I really thought about buying a place in Wyoming. It was very cheap. You know, you, you know this is rural Wyoming. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for twenty five, thirty thousand dollars, I could have I could have bought something. But I started thinking if I go to Wyoming, I'm going to drive because I'm going to need a car there. 
Oh, yeah. It's going to take me three days to get there. I'm going to have to eat Wyoming food, which is probably <laughs> all processed and, yes. and, and junk. And if I go to Wyoming, the entertainment is going to be, I'm going to go to the neighborhood bar and get the shit beaten out of me every weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I'm, because I'm too short or, or, or I'm, too, I'm too Jewish or I'm too liberal or I'm a Democrat. <laughs> Who knows? What? But the entertainment would be beating the shit out of me. <laughs> and Donna would be like, I'm not going to Wyoming. <laughs> no, this is before well, Donna. You know, I, I have gone to Casper, Wyoming for the holidays. Yeah. I had a really good friend. We went to a pool hall and this guy comes up to me. I'm waiting my turn to shoot pool. And he stoops down low and he goes, my name is George. <gasps> oh, my God. What? What is the... your name? Oh my and I, god! And I, it didn't, it didn't register right away. So what? I, oh, yeah, you know, my name. Did you is say? Donna. Did you say E T? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh my lord! Oh my goodness! This yeah. Was, well, this was in the late eighties, I guess. Yeah, but it was so bizarre, and like, he was stunned that I was speaking English. Absolutely oh, stunned. God. <laughs> Uh, without an accent. Sorry, Jaja is so loud. Jaja, I love that. Jaja, <laughs> she is the loudest finch we have ever had. Was that you? Have one finch? No, we have uh, Ali, who is Muslim, and <laughs> Jaja, who is Muslim. Hungarian. I... Her nickname is Squawky. She's the loudest finch we've ever had, and the two of them are the messiest finches we've ever had. I've found turds. 10 feet away from there. No way. Kate. No, I mean, I swear to God, I what found one right by the back door. Yeah. And I'm just yelling at him like, how could you possibly do that? How could you possibly do that? And oh it's just God. like, I think when they're flying, oh. they just shoot off a bomb. Or so you let them out of the cage normally, right? No, you can't. They're so neurotic. They would never come back into the cage. Oh, but oh, you wow. said that when they're... But you said when they're flying that they they let out, you know. Oh, when they're flying in the cage. Oh, in the cage. They're shooting turds out the back. Oh, oh my goodness. God, I and love she's, that. She is just so loud. She's nuts. Yeah. And they both want to, you know, participate. So they're pissed off. They're in the bedroom. <laughs> when I was a kid, we lived in California for a little while in San Diego. And I had a parakeet. My mother said, oh, it flew out the window. So I really saw, really saw. Turns out a year later, the cat. Kill the bird. Anyway, oh my God, that's my bird story. California. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. I'm going to pick up where we left off. So I once worked in Kentucky, in Florence, Kentucky, and I was in a mall and these teenagers walked past me and they were staring at me. I looked at them. I don't know. They were, they were laughing. And I said something like, I said some, oh, oh, oh. One of them said, do you know Jackie Chan? And I, <laughs> and, and I said, I said, he's my cousin. <laughs> and their eyes, their eyes lit up and they walked, they were walking away, said, oh, my God, you hear that? It's her cousin. And I was like, <laughs> and then yeah. I went to a Chinese restaurant and everyone, I mean, there wasn't the wait staff. Th there was no one Asian. So I thought, huh. So when when the waiter came over, I said, is the chef Chinese or Asian? And he just looked at me like, how dare you? And, 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 you know, clearly, clearly I offended them. And I'm sure anyone can cook Chinese. But, right. you know, you kind of expect that you wouldn't find that in New York. Uh, well, I mean, you do, but it's more kind of fusion, if you will. You know what I mean? And I just I was just like, OK, I can never live here. I did eat a lot uh, in big boys, Bob's big boys or something. <laughs> and um, I got a lot of stairs there, too. And all I thought was, <laughs> you know. I mean, I it was I worked for GE Aircraft Engine, so it was a field assignment, and I worked with all these mechanics. All of them had, uh, first of all, as a field assignment, you work with the people to understand how to future better design. Uh -huh. um, so I was working with all these young mechanics. First, had never seen uh, a female on the field in that airport, and then an Asian, and then it was just like it blew their minds. So I had to. You know, I would just like get to know them. And they said, oh, wow, you sound like Katie Couric. And I said, oh, that, 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 you know, guess what? That's a compliment, right? That's a compliment. I'm glad they didn't think I was going to speak Chinese to them. 
But uh, when I left, they really got a good dose of, um, I guess, an Asian American, uh, what have you. And I don't think they would ever look at another person, you know, that's different. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, I hope. I hope. I mean, you know, I use the language that they use, which was a lot of um, effing this, effing that. And they were like, oh, yeah. cool, cool. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. OK, I right. digress. Right. You're talking about the people sound wonderful in Brittany. Can you tell a story about the, the bay leaf and the soap, but the market? My village is about 500 people. The village right next to it is 7000 people. And that's sort of the commercial center for, for the area. So once a week, they have a, uh, a market, and the market is on both sides, or at least it used to be, on both sides of the river. And they had just all kinds of exotic things there, and, 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 and regular things, too. I mean, the most exotic thing I ever saw was a, a huge, huge uh, semi-truck. I mean, just, I don't know, how 30 feet long? The sides came up, and it was filled with birds in cages. Oh, oh my was, goodness! He, the guy just drove around with birds and, and sold the bird, and, and you'd you'd walk by, and the birds would just be singing Family. happily, singing, and yeah. So that was the most exotic. But the other other things are, you know, regular household items. Although you can buy house insurance or mattresses or uh, clothing or um, wow. rugs or get get your windows replaced. But mostly it's food stuff. I was uh, looking for a bay leaf because I was going to make a a. Uh, uh, spaghetti dish, and I wanted to make a tomato sauce with a with a with the bay leaf. But again, this is before all of the electronic devices that you just talk into and get the information you want. Right. Usually, when I went out shopping, I looked the word up for what I, I wanted to get, or I write it down. But I didn't this time. I forgot, and I figured, yeah, a bay leaf. I'll just find a bay leaf. I know what a bay leaf looks like. One of the stalls was a spice stall. It was filled with spices from all around the world and olives and all kinds of nice little uh, goody treats. And I'm looking and there's no, there's no bay leaf. I mean, how do you not have a bay leaf in a spice store? I asked the lady, of course, I don't know the words, uh, Madame, uh, avez-vous uh, un bay leaf? <laughs> uh, bay leaf, bay leaf. <laughs> and, you know, she's looking like, you know, well, what the hell? I just bought a, a bunch of fresh spaghetti from the uh, spaghetti lady. Mm. So, I, you know, I hold up the bag. I, I open the bag. She looks in. Pot. I say, je voudrais faire la sauce pour la pot. Mm. Uh, <laughs> nice. You know? Nice. And then, then I start going, bay leaf. Bay leaf. <laughs> <laughs> so she doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about. She leaves her stall, which these people never do goes over to the guy next door who's selling hats and says to him, Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> so they're both, you know, muttering about Bailey's. Nobody knows what the hell it is. You know, I go away. I come back later. I try it again. I look around for other spice places. There aren't any other spice places. You know, I go home uh, without a bay leaf. I, I can't believe it. And uh, so Madam P comes over. She, she was over almost every day because she had a garden at my house because uh, her house didn't have any land. So she was over to, to tend to her garden. And, and I explained to her that, you know, I was looking for the, for the bay leaf. And, but at that point I had looked it up ah, um, and, ah. and it's laurel, of course. <laughs> so I, you know, I explained to her that I was looking for l'orient or laurel or whatever, however the hell I pronounce it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, she just starts laughing and laughing, which she usually does whenever I'm doing something. <laughs> and she takes me out to the back of the house, shows me I've got a bay leaf tree. <laughs> and they're not selling bay leaves at the market because everybody's got a bay leaf tree. <gasps> and who the hell's going to buy what they can get for free? Oh, my God. <laughs> but the next week, I went back to the market. Yeah. And I went past the spice lady sort of trying to avoid her. And she calls me over. She says, monsieur, monsieur, monsieur. And she holds up. She has a whole branch of bay leaves that she brought for me. Oh. Uh. So she understood finally. <laughs> well, she finally figured it out, I guess. Yeah. Um, she figured it out somehow. I don't know how. And she brought me a branch of bay leaves. Oh, my God. And um, hilarious. also that that first week I was there, I bought a bar of soap that was made from honey. Okay. It had this honey fragrance or whatever. I got so flustered with the bay leaf lady that I, I, I forgot i bought the soap and i left it there this is the first summer i'm there so i don't own the oh. house i'm renting 
these people have never seen me before. They don't know if they're ever going to see me again. Mm -hmm. I come back to the market the next week. Lady sees me walking by and she hands me the bag with myself in it. She saved it for me, brought it back and figured you might come back. I'll be here. Oh, wow. That is so nice. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So it sounds and like people they- there. People there are very curious. They they, they ask you all kinds of questions oh. uh, about what you're doing, something they see, even something they know about. They ask you about it anyhow to get your take on it. Oh my God, that's so interesting. And they also want to more and more. They want to try their English yeah. out. Yeah, ah. they never used to do that. Oh. But when they see how fractured our French is, and they go, <laughs> "Oh, they're thinking, oh, they're Americans, okay." Let's so then them. they want to practice English. Yeah, that's not a bad yeah. idea. I mean, people have been very friendly, very helpful. I mean, God knows we need help all the time. <laughs> um, very trusting. I don't feel ever been ripped off or lied mm-hmm. to Wow. Uh, or misled. Okay. Uh, I mean, you sort of have to learn how to, how, to, how to do things. When you ask a question, you get a literal answer. You've got to know how to ask the right question. And I always try to add on anything else. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Can't be joking around. Lay it on me. Yeah, exactly. And Donna, do you feel the same way about the people there? Oh, yeah. They're... Remember when we were with Jean-Tien and Danielle? We we're, were having a picnic somewhere. I forget. It's a really small town. It was a really warm day. Oh, yeah. So we're getting organized. And this elderly woman comes running out of her house asking us if we need water. Oh my She's goodness. worried that we're going to faint or something. It was it was really really unseasonably warm. One of those ninety degree days. Oh my lord, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Wait, so it all right, have, it would have been so impolite to say, "Oh, I'm fine." Right. So be grateful, even if yeah. you don't need the water. You know, you accept the kindness. Yes, oh yes. wow. So this brings me to ask you: Is Brittany a safe place? Is there any crime? Oh, I had a refrigerator safe. stolen. What? <laughs> What are you talking about? Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. I got a better one. Okay, okay. It was okay. stolen from your house. What's the story there? What do you What do um, you mean? I don't know what the story is. It happened when I was gone. My house and the house next door. I, somebody must have been setting up a house somewhere because they stole my refrigerator and his TV. <laughs> okay. It, isn't the door? Did they? Was it broken in or? or yeah, how the did... door was. The door was. I, I mean, it's not like you've got really solid locks, but mm-hmm. I don't remember. I think they sort of picked their way around the um, uh, the wood frame of the door. But you know, it's absolutely safe. You know, I rent the house to uh, single women quite often. Okay. And the first thing know. everybody says is they immediately feel safe there. The normal urban fears of living in a in a city, especially mm-hmm. especially for single women vanishes okay just vanishes okay. people have said it repeatedly okay good to know because wow. we have people have asked if i yeah. move abroad and i'm a single female what do i look for and where do, do you I have, avoid? You no not at all not only that you know since we rent the house and we do have people like cutting the grass or whatever they'll ask the person if they need help for anything or you know they're just so open and kind Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah the guy the guy i thought wanted to commit suicide who rented he didn't have a car my friends in the next village when they came into town once a week to go shopping picked him up and took him shopping and then brought him home oh my goodness that is really nice talk about shopping is there a supermarket near you oh yeah huge one huge supermarché two actually and you have to drive there in the village of seven thousand. okay so you have to drive there yeah. You, you could walk, but you wouldn't want to carry your packages back. <laughs> right. But how far is that walk? Like 10 minutes? Two, two miles. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, it's all it's all along the river. It's a beautiful walk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, the walk is, is is easy and comfortable, but you don't want to carry your packages. Right. right. Absolutely. OK, let me ask, because I forgot before. Do you bank there or do you have a, an account? Yeah, I have there a bank or? account there. Yeah. OK. And how was that easy to open or what what's that like? It was easy to open because when I'm when when we did the closing with the notaire, he gave me a note that was like a oh. get out of jail card right, right, <laughs> that right, I took right. to the I bank. Got... And actually, Madam P also helped me uh, okay. open the account. OK, so that sounds good. But you've heard yeah. that, that it can be difficult, correct? It's very difficult. It's very difficult to, to get a telephone. 
Um, it's very difficult to get uh, utilities turned on. You have to have zillions of kinds of proof and documentation. Oh, okay. When you talk about a telephone, you talk about a cell phone or a home phone? Uh, well, I take the cell phone from here, but I don't use it as a phone. I just use it for Wi-Fi. Sure. And then we have a, a landline. Okay. 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 So the banking was easy for him. Because you so the landline the is on all the time. Wi-Fi is on all the time. The dehumidifier is on all the time. <laughs> right. Um, 20, 24 seven. So your utility bill is probably a little higher because you have all that stuff. Um, no, because basically the house is closed six, six months, seven months a mm. year. I mean, right. those things are on, but nobody's using anything else. Right. Gotcha. And they okay. do their utility bills differently there. You know, here, you get your monthly bill based on your use. Mm -hmm. There you get a yearly bill. They figure out what your cost is per month and you get that every month. So it's stable. Okay. Another way of helping of helping renters. You don't one month get a huge bill. Right. And then at the end of the year, everything tallies up. Right. You either right. get a bill for a little more or if you paid too much, you get a, a refund. Well, wow. we have that in New York also, like our gas bill and everything else is averaged out per month. So, you know, oh, okay. it, yeah. Okay. Um, well, you also have to tell them about the fuel thing that you put, you know, the thing you have to buy. You mean the gas tank? Yeah. The propane? Because uh, it, yeah. it's not here, normal here. Yeah. 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 It's a separate propane tank for the kitchen stove. So you just pick that up whenever you run you out. You just pick, pick that up and, and hook it up. The stove is interesting. The stove oh. has three gas burners, one electric burner, an electric oven. Oh, is wow. that like the app? Is that the norm? Yeah, it it, it is. It's not uncommon. Oh, and it, okay. it's a convection oven. Hmm. Oh, so I guess if you run out, you know, propane, you can just turn on the electric side. Right. And cook. Yeah. so you always yeah. have a means to. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. interesting yeah. So yeah. there's no gas line coming to the house. No, it's all independent. Yeah. Is that is that because of where you guys are? I mean, probably. I don't know if it would be the same in a big city. Sure. OK. We just yeah. got a sewer line three years ago. What? It's been, oh my it's been septic tank for 30 years, but okay. we've had fiber optics for, for Wi-Fi for 15 yeah. years. <laughs> hey, priorities, you know? Yes. Well, I don't know, actually. <laughs> yeah, there's no, like where we are, there are no telephone poles. Oh, but you have, have your you ever thought about that? I mean, yeah. we just. Yeah, you know, all the wiring's underground. Oh, oh that's nice. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's yeah. A problem. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> All right. I think we've covered a lot, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask about social activities. I know you had talked about walking around outside. Are there theaters or what what types yeah. of social? Can you tell us? The town of 7000 has a, um, a state of the art movie theater. Both Brest and Camper have multiple theaters, movie theaters, live theater. Festivals. Festivals, lots of festivals. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, there's a Celtic festival. There's a Breton festival. There are historic festivals where people dress up in, in uh, medieval clothing. There are religious festivals. Boat okay. festival. Yeah, boat festival. boat festival. We actually have more of a social life there than here. There are about five families that have basically adopted us. We get invited to everything with these families. And at this point, we've known them now. So when we, when we met them, the kids were 10 years old. Mm -hmm. The kids are now parents. So wow. we know three, three generations of the families feel very, very much a part of the families. Nice. And, and it's only yeah, about also, two miles. You know, I yeah. think since we're not family, we're kind of outsiders, they treat us as insiders in a different way. I mean, I think they act a little differently, like maybe freer because Americans oh. are crazy. Right. <laughs> And they also, I think at times they confide in us. So they don't really, that wouldn't necessarily, they would say that to somebody else in their family. Because they know we can't tell anybody. <laughs> what? <laughs> that can't be. They trust you. <laughs> you're funny. You're funny. You know, you know, three generations and you get such an, an intimate view of family life. And family life is so important to them. Yes. You hear what's going on with them or troubles or illness or divorce or. Right. And they're yeah, there the for you because it's a social unit. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I have another question. Are there a lot of expats where you live? Whether no. from the United States? No. We're the only Americans. Really? Um, there, there, yeah. There are some Brits okay. Uh, okay. In, in the area. 
they sort of fall into two categories. There's, there's the one category that really likes being there, really likes French people, and does everything they can to assimilate. And there's the other group that forms a little British colony and sits <laughs> around talking bad things about the French. <laughs> <laughs> a little British colony. <laughs> I love that. Well, I can't believe you guys are the only Americans there. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. Wow. And people, when people who don't know us run into us, they think we're British because that's sure. mostly who's there. And when they find out they're Americans, we're Americans, the, the reaction is kind of interesting. It's always welcoming. Yeah, they embrace that's you. And they're like, and they're not from the Brit colony. <laughs> they're, they're, <laughs> no, they're more prickly towards the English than towards us. And I've even had older people come up to me and thank me for the war really <laughs> yeah and yeah. you you accept that proudly i do, I do. <laughs> on behalf of the united states of america good for you here's the, a veteran discount this is yeah. Vietnam yeah. war protesters yeah. accepting yeah yeah i love it i that's love it nice that's nice that's america okay all right very good I think we've covered almost everything we intended to. Any words of advice, guys, for people who wish to embark on a similar journey? I would say this about going anywhere to another country is you're not the all about me American. You really have to, you know, if you're going to travel to another country, you go with that. That's what we try to do. I mean, we make mistakes because we don't know any better. (laughs) <laughs> but they're not like we're the be all and end all of everything. Right. Even if you speak, even if you say bonjour, they know that you're trying to defer to their culture. So even if your your French is fractured, they know that you're trying. Right. You want to choose what you're comfortable with. I mean, we made no decision to change anything. Probably the biggest decision we made was in 2007, while we were both working full time and not really thinking about retirement. I had been living in in an apartment for 20 years. It had three bedrooms, two baths, tons of storage space, lots of land. It was gorgeous up in the the Oakland Hills. The owner decided about three weeks before I was going to France that she was going to sell and we had to move. So basically had three weeks to pack everything up. No. I had three weeks yeah. to pack. <laughs> you went to yeah, France. I went yeah, to you, went France. <laughs> you went to so, France, lest you forget. I had to get that house ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, <laughs> sure, sure. In the last weekend, so, right. <laughs> so we had to make a decision. Where are we going to go? I had the house in France at that point. Donna owned the house in Alameda. It's a duplex, mm-hmm. and it was rented. Mm-hmm. And we had to decide if we were going to rent another place or buy something else. Um, and buying something else meant one or both of us would have to sell our houses. I'm not selling France. I'm not selling my duplex. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that took care of that decision. Yeah. And then we both decided, you know, we're not going to rent again because somebody else is going to throw us out. And right. then, you know, then we're going to be doing this again. Now I'm his landlord. You know? Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's, and that's right. the way you want it. Just so I lucky. write her a monthly check. Yeah. <laughs> No, no. In all seriousness, just so lucky that Donna had that place because the real estate oh. in the Bay Area is just insane. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. A, oh, it's totally. I, crazy. I wouldn't be here if she didn't have it. Yeah. Right. You know, I don't know right. where I'd be. Yeah, you better behave. So that was. <laughs> you're right. That was the big decision. You're right, Gil. <laughs> that, you know, that was the big decision, and then we downsized. Right, we went from three bedrooms to two, or two bathrooms to one, and right. no storage. No yeah. story. So, so we did, got rid of a ton of stuff. Was that yeah. hard that, to get rid of stuff, guys? No, no, no. But that was the big decision. Mm-hmm. After that, it was just we had already laid the groundwork for a life that we liked. We liked the tri-coastal life and and uh, and the bi-continental life. Mm-hmm. All we did was expand the time in the places we liked. We didn't right. really change anything else. We just spend more time there. And uh, we, one of us, could have given up a house, but. Since we travel, yeah. it's like living in the duplex and having, you know, somebody downstairs. Right. They're keeping an eye on the play. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, ah. That's always it, good. Well, that works out well. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. It wasn't a deliberate decision when I bought it or when we moved here. It was just like, oh, you know, it's we, more we, convenient. Mm-hmm, we make mm-hmm. very few deliberate decisions. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you know what? I think that gives everyone comfort because so many people have a tough time planning. You know, I I just took retirement a few months ago and Jean's going to take it in about three years. I think every article that we're coming across these days is, do I have enough? Do I have enough? And, And I just realized a lot of it depends on how much you spend a year. And if you don't have that number down, then you're always going to be kind of in the dark or anxious driven, right? Your, your, right? your anxiety levels. And so we're trying to figure all that out. Although like you, we're not doing it deliberately. You know, like tomorrow <laughs> I might freak out and say, oh my God, what did we spend last month? I'll sit there and go through Excel spreadsheets and, and I'll say, oh, we've got to cut back. We've got to cook more. But do right. we do that? No, we don't. Yeah, right. Because right. because we're lazy and we're tired, so we just <laughs> well, well. Also, you like the life you, you like the life you have. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we don't cook often. <laughs> no, well, we we didn't until COVID. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, now we, we both cook. We would eat out three or four nights a week. I mean, we were never home. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think this has been incredibly fun. And it's been hilarious. <laughs> and and I thoroughly fruitful. enjoyed it. Yeah, no, we're so happy yeah, to have you met so you. This is great. Yeah. Well, you too. Do you, yeah. Do, you, do you guys ever come out here? Yes, we, we have. A, I have. Well, yeah. I was the last one. I went with our son Max. Must have been right before the pandemic. What about the wedding? When? We, oh, that was that before. was before. So that's okay. about four years ago. Yeah, we would we do a trip. So my sister lives in Berkeley, so we do yeah. come out once in a while. Yeah. Well, we do a trip back east, also. I, my, I have an aunt in Brooklyn, and you know, family in New York, and. We were going to go back in November, but we're just not ready to get on a plane. Yeah. But we owe you a dinner if you come here. Yeah, if you come <laughs> no, out no, here. No, no, no. We should all meet at Apote. Or maybe and, we'll and, come to know, Brittany. You <laughs> should visit us in Brittany. I yeah. mean, people, we get lots of visitors, and we love having people come. Yeah, that'd be so much funny. fun. Show you all around. Yeah, thank You're you. Okay. okay, love you thank guys. You. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you know someone who's relocated for retirement and wishes to share their story with us, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Our email address is gg at retirethere.com. Our website is retirethere.com. And you may follow us on Twitter at retirethere underscore. Now, if you've liked our show, please subscribe and rate it in Apple Podcasts. In the meantime, be well. Be well.